So our speaker, uh, Mohammed Alhamdadi, is going to give his second talk on uh, survey of quantum theory. Okay. Professor Mohammed, you can carry on. Uh, again, thanks uh, for the organizer for the invitation. Uh, I will continue then my talk. Basically, I'm just surveying the theory of quantum. And uh, today I will start from where we stopped yesterday. Basically, we'll pick up from uh, topological quantums. And then I will talk in the second half, or second part of the talk, I will talk about quantum rings and some uh, recent work of uh, Barodakov, Cassie, and C. Okay, then, uh, sorry. Uh, okay, here is the definition of topological quantum, which we saw yesterday, but it doesn't hurt to see it again. Then you require your binary operation to be continuous. You require that the right multiplications are homeomorphism, and you have the right invertibility. Now, the, some classical examples are uh, Alexander quantum on the real line. You just require non-zero non uh, real number t, and you take x triangle y equal tx plus one minus ty. Same thing as we saw for, uh, for groups, you have the conjugation quandle and the core quandle. The other example which is important for uh, spheres and the projective space is when you have in general a Riemann manifold with an isometry, you define the quandle operation this way. This is in uh, uh, Rubinstein's paper. Uh, on the sphere, basically, if you just take uh, A and B and you rotate A around B with the same angle to get A triangle B. And if you have X, an element on the sphere, you can think of it as vector, Y as a vector, and X triangle Y will be rotating, uh, rotating uh, uh, X uh, 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 around Y by the same angle. And the algebra formula is just this. You do the dot product X, Y, twice that y minus x and this gives uh, a quant topological quantum on the projective plane uh, okay here is the an example qu uh, topological quantum on the torus uh, taken okay i start to make it simple i start with two by two matrix over the integers that is invertible gl2 of z uh, basically determinants being invertible in Z, meaning plus one or minus one, and define the quantum operation. I write the elements as vectors. Think of them as vectors. I have two vectors on R2, and the quantum operation will be M, the matrix M applied to X, plus identity, two by two identity matrix minus M, Y. This looks like the affine quantum, the same formula like that. Tx plus one minus Ty, except we are doing slightly higher, we're using matrices here. Uh, one notice that if you take two vectors with uh, integers, integers vectors, you can prove, you can check straightforward from the, the, this definition that X plus M triangle Y plus N gives X triangle Y plus M triangle N. Now, since M triangle N still lies in Z in the Z2, because M and N were chosen in Z2, thus, you can pass to the quotients and you get a quantum structure on the torus S1 cross S1. Now you see here that uh, I used uh, two by two matrix, but you can replace to the, the size of the matrix by any integer greater or equal to two. Then basically you can take Rn, take uh, a matrix in GLN of Z, n by n uh, square matrix over integers, that is invertible, determines equal plus or minus one, and all this works perfectly, and you end up with a uh, topological quantum structure on the torus Tn, uh, n copies of the circle. Okay, uh, this is the definition of quantum homomorphism. Uh, we require that the function has to be continuous because we are in the category of topological spaces. It is quantum homomorphism, continuous, and if it is homeomorphism, then we're talking about isomorphism of quantum. And uh, this is an example of the topological quantum I showed yesterday, just three by three, uh, 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 a quantum of three elements. Uh, this is the quantum operation. This is just uh, this joint union of, of singleton one. 
with the other orbit two or three. You can go from three to two, you can go from two to three, but if you start from one, you will never go anywhere, but you remain on one always. Then one is uh, an orbit with singleton, and the, the pair two, three makes the other orbit. These are two topologies on, on this, uh, on this uh, set. Then you have two topological structures on this finite set, and they are not isomorphic as topological quantile because the two topologies are not homeomorphic. Okay, here I give the definition of what is called the topological Alexander quantile. And uh, if you recall yesterday, we saw the, what I think we call the generalized Alexander quantile. Then it's very similar, except here we are dealing with to topology basically. We're bringing the topology into, into play. Then take an, uh, an abelian group, topological abelian group, a real line, a circle S1. It has to be abelian, obviously. You cannot take S3, uh, normal one quaternions. Then take an automorphism, a continuous automorphism of the group. We're going to see in a moment, I'll show you the classification of uh, uh, topological Alexander Quandel on the real line. And then you define the binary operation by X triangle Y equal F of X plus identity minus F applied to Y. And one can check, obviously, you have to check that this gives a topological quantile. Right multiplication is invertible, you know, it's homeomorph uh, homeomorphism. And uh, the right distributivity holds. Uh, and obviously, the idempotency also. Okay, then this is a nice example of topological, uh, what we call topological Alexander quantile. The first example is take the real line. Uh, sorry, I call here sigma, this is a typo, it should be f. And take f of x equal tx, I have to, this is not correct, it should be f of x equal tx for all t not equal zero. And then we have a topological Alexander quantile on the real line. Uh, pick two real numbers x and y, x triangle y will be tx plus one minus t1. Okay. Uh, I will talk about uh, a classification of topological Alexander quantile on the real line. These are really interesting problem. I investigated this with my quarter, uh, Dion Chang from Beijing Normal University and my colleague uh, Boris Shexman in my department. Uh, this is a paper we published in Topology uh, and this application in 2018. The result is that if you take two topological quantile structures on the real line, they are isomorphic as topological quantile if and only if this, uh, the, the, the non-zero real number which define each of them have to be equal. Then I take the first quantile operation denoted star sub one, which is x star sub one y equal ax plus one minus a y, a non-zero obviously, uh, replace A by some other number, B, a real number, and you have two, topologi two uh, topological quantile structures on the real line. Then they're going to be isomorphic if and only if A equal B. Uh, we proved this by uh, a few cases, obviously, and uh, there are some technicalities, but I'll show some parts of the proof trying to avoid the, the technical part or trying to skip a little bit. But I'll explain the idea, basically. Uh, after this, we looked at uh, topological Alexander topological quantile on, on the circle S1. You get basically similar uh, analogous result. It's in the paper. And if I recall properly, we made conjecture about uh, uh, quantile structures on the closed interval 0, 1. But it looked like uh, our conjecture was this. Uh, okay, then here is the, the easy uh, case is assume T, T1 equal 1. Then R star one is just trivial quantile, X, X star one uh, Y equal, uh, equal, uh, equal X. Remember, I put one here, one minus one is zero, then it's just, this, the first one is the trivial quantile, the real line with trivial quantile, X triangle Y equal X for every X, Y. The second one is, I assume that T2 is not one. Okay, which makes it, then this is T2X plus one minus T2Y with the T2 not equal one. 
then it's not hard, it's very quick to see that this, you cannot have uh, uh, the trivial topological quantum structure on R being isomorphic to uh, another Alexander quantum structure on R with T not equal one. Uh, the proof is just straightforward. Uh, assume uh, at the opposite that you have certain homeomorphism of R which, which satisfied, which uh, preserved the, the operation, the quantal operation. X star one Y is just X because it's trivial quantal. On the, on the other way, it has to be F of X star two F of Y in the, the, the target R with star two which is given explicitly by this, but here you are over the real line, this is easy to solve. Since T2 is not one, then one minus T2 is invertible in R, and then you, if, this, if this hold, you will have FB in constant function, and that's impossible because it is a homeomorphy. Uh, again, I'm showing few cases, relatively easy. The last one will be a little bit technical and uh, obviously I skip some technicalities as much as I can. Uh, the second case, assume that T1 is greater than 1 and uh, T2 between 0 and 1. Basically the idea is uh, without loss of generality we can assume that T1 and T2 are both positive and then the idea was we are on the positive real line and we just uh, discuss we put 1, 0, 1 and then we discuss the cases depending, we order obviously, we can assume T1 less than T2 and we can see where, where they belong. They can be both between zero and one, one of them between zero and one, the other one greater, etc. Just basically few cases and we solve the problem. Now, if T1 is greater than one and T2 less than one, being positive, again, assume that you have a, a, an, iso, an isomorphism between these two uh, topological Alexander quantiles you will have this equation. This is just f of x star one y equal uh, f of x star two of f y. Now one can see that uh, by little manipulation, we can assume that f sends zero to zero. Okay, if need be, you can change f to another function g of x being fx plus b by translation. Now, if f of zero equals zero, obviously, uh, if you set y equals zero in this equation, you get f of t1x equal t2 of fx. Now, the function is homeomorphism, and then you get contradiction because f is monotonic. Remember, t1 is greater than one, while t2 is less than one. Then this will become a contradiction. Uh, here is the case. This one is a little bit technical, and I'll explain mainly the idea. Uh, this one took us a little while to get to get it out. Uh, one can see that there are little analogies with the the case I worked with my students about uh, over Z n, with how we proved that uh, the the quantal automorphism over Z n are exactly the affine function. This is uh, one of the results I mentioned yesterday by Jennifer McQuarrie and Ricardo Restrepo. Okay, then I assume T1 greater than T2 greater than one. And uh, we take, assume that you have a certain uh, homeomorphism phi, which uh, preserve the operation. Then you're gonna have this, this uh, equality. Phi of T1x plus one minus T1y equal T2 phi x plus one minus T2 phi y. Again, as I did in the previous case, one can assume that phi sends zero to zero. Now, obviously, phi of one cannot be zero because it's homeomorphism. Now, the good thing about this, that being non-zero and we are on the real line, we can divide, we can somehow normalize. We can assume that phi sends one to one. Then phi is becoming a little bit nicer. It sends zero to zero, it sends one to one. It's homeomorphism over the real line. Now, if phi of one equals one, then, uh, uh, by doing little uh, substitution, you can get these two identities. P of T1 X equal T2 V X, that's just, I guess, setting, uh, setting Y equal zero. And if you set X equal zero, you get the other equation. Now, the idea is this, that we constructed the uh, uh, sequence, okay, uh, such that uh, the sequence will converge to one, but when you apply phi to it, it, it doesn't go to one, and that's how we get the contradiction. 
Now, uh, V of T1, X equal T2, V of X. I can iterate this, and then I can get powers of T1. That's clear. And with little manipulation, you get this, this identity. You can do the same thing here. I can divide by 1 minus T2, and I can write V of X equal 1 over T minus 2, multiply V of 1 minus T1, X, and you can iterate. You get these two equations. Now, uh, we have V of 1 equal 1. Then I can just set X equal 1, and you get this, this, this uh, identity for integers m n you have v of t1 to the m divided by 1 minus t1 to the 2n equal t2 to the m over 1 minus t2 to the 2n now the next step will be the, the trick is to to do the right choice of certain sequence uh, such that a sequence in m like double sequence in m and n such that the sequence will converge to 1 and when we apply V, uh, since V is homeomorphism, uh, if the sequence converts to one, its image should converge to one. And that's how we get the contradiction. Uh, this is the next, uh, the other, uh, the, the idea of the proof. And uh, now this may look like parachuted, but there is a reason why we did that. I mean, you can see it from what's coming in, in the proof. And also, if I go back here, Remember, I want to create certain sequence in such way that I can turn this to one. Then basically, uh, I have to switch, you know, on the top you have M, on the bottom is 2N, then uh, this is the right choice. Okay, we assume, obviously we take the quantity LN, L is the natural logarithm, LN of 1 minus T1 squared divided by LN T1, and we discuss, it's real number, then two cases, it's either irrational or rational number. If it's rational, if it's irrational, we choose the sequence mi over ni to converge to ln of 1 minus t squared over ln t1. If it's rational, <coughs> we just choose <coughs> uh, m over n, you know, uh, mi over uh, uh, ni to be m over n. Uh, we get, which means that uh, phi of this converts to phi of 1. But phi is homeomorphism, it has to be, uh, we already assumed that phi of 1 equal 1. Now, if we go back here, uh, oops, sorry. Yes, you have this equality. Now you have to do the, uh, you have to look at the, the right side here. I take the right side of this. On the right hand side, we have limit of t2 to the mi divided by 1 minus t2 to the 2ni. This is just a little bit of uh, algebra using the exponential and logarithmic uh, form. Then to get the contradiction, I basically have to prove that this piece, because I'm doing exponential of logarithm, I just have to prove that this limit is not zero. That's basically which makes the whole proof to hold. And uh, one just compute this limit and uh, check that it's not uh, zero. Again, I'm skipping a few details. I have to prove that this quantity, this fraction, this is fraction, I have to prove that this numerator is never zero, which is the case by considering certain function and proving that it's not uh, Limit of n i is not zero, then you get this. Okay. Then basically, uh, what we proved, uh, discussing a few cases, that if you take two topological Alexander Quandl structures on a real line, they are uh, isomorphic if and only if uh, the values T1 equal T2. This is completely different than the discrete case. Okay, now I, I'm going to talk about. Uh, um, Coloring of knots by topological quandals. This is taken from the paper of uh, uh, Rubinstein. I will show you some examples taken from, uh, from that paper. And uh, after you'll hear the talk of uh, Yosef Pichiski, you can know a little bit of quant of uh, Kovanov homology, and then I will mention some relation between the coloring spaces and of homology, but you just have to be patient till you hear the, the other talk. Okay, uh, this is the braid group. Okay, the braid group is basically you take n strings and you braid them. This is well known. The braid group uh, on n string is given by the generator sigma 1, sigma n minus 1. The relations are this. If i and j are far parts, basically you can, you can commute them. You have two strings uh, uh, here. Basically, I'll show you the pictures in a moment. 
if they are next to each other, I and I plus one, this is exactly the one way of writing Redmaster move three, four, Redmaster move three. You have sigma I, sigma I plus one, sigma I equals sigma I plus one, sigma I, sigma I plus one. Uh, sigma i the generators are this basically uh, if you slice your braid you can assume that at every slice you have exactly one generator or obviously it's inverse now the sigma i is you have n strings you take the i's i string and the i plus one and you put cross in between them here everything else remain vertical like identity and the inverse is just the mirror image, this is positive crossing, this is a negative crossing. Uh, now it's clearly because you have n of them, you only get n minus one generators. Now for small number, if b equal two, you know what is b2. That's clearly integer z because you're gonna have only one generator sigma one, and then a group uh, generated by sigma one will be z. Uh, b equal three, b3 is interesting, it's nice, interesting. Uh, a group okay uh, here i put <coughs> sorry i put a picture of the figure eight knot this is the only knot with four crossing and they put its braid form uh, i think i mentioned yesterday the website of uh, knot info uh, chuck livingston at the university of indiana you just put knot info that knot info on google we're going to take you there and you can choose your knot, you can select uh, what you want, uh, the braid form of it. The braid index is the minimum number of strings to make the braid. Now, if you look at this one here, obviously I'm making it by three strings. I can make it with four strings, but if I do, there will be some redundancy. Then we don't want that. Basically, I can add another string here and uh, just put crossing at the bottom. This is, uh, has to deal with the mark of stabilization. Uh, uh, every knot correspond to the closure of, of braid, that's Alexander theorem. And when you study braids, the question obviously, uh, I give you two braids, can you tell me when they can, uh, if I close them, I get the same knot? Okay, this is Markov's theorem, either conjugation or stabilization. Uh, okay, then uh, here, this is, if you look at this, the braid here, I have sigma one, I'm braiding the first string with the second one into a positive way. This is the negative, then it's sigma two, negative, sigma one, sigma two. Now the good thing about braid, I can, you, I can put this on the computer, I can prog program them in Maple, you know, I just put the, the top vector, the variables I put a vector. I tell the computer how to color as it passes through each crossing, either positive or negative. I give the quantile operation or the inverse operation and I can get the vector at the bottom. And then I just want to close, meaning I want fixed points of that action or that move. Okay, then uh, the braid group BN acts on the Cartesian product XN, okay? And this is just exactly what, uh, what I showed you on the picture, and they go back to it. The first N, uh, the first I minus one string, they go down identity. And then what happened is just between the i and the i plus one string. Again, from the i plus two string till the last one, nothing happened. You basically go back here, oops. Then this is x1, x1, xi minus one, xi minus one. Here, I'm sorry, yeah, here xi and xi plus one. Then the xi plus one will come down here, and here you get the quantile operation. This will be xi triangle xi plus one. The others will remain the same. This is for the uh, positive crossing. For the negative, you put the inverse operation. Then you get an action of the braid group on the Cartesian product. And uh, it gives a continuous map between Xn and Xn. It's exactly what I said, the vector on the top. And out of it, you, you get the newer one. By the action, you get this vector here. and. Uh, uh, Rubinstein in his paper defines the, the coloring space of knots by given topological quantum. Then assume that your K is the closure of certain braid, W, okay? I assume it's an uh, N string. Then the, fixed, the space of fixed point of this action 
Now here I'm writing sigma i. Obviously, when you have break, you have uh, every element is, is a product of sigma i plus or minus, etc. Then this is defin defi defined on the generator, and then obviously you extend it to the whole group, action of whole group. Uh, the space of fixed point is the space of coloring, and it is the, now you get a topological space defined up to homeomorphism. Obviously, it's a richer structure because in the if you have a finite quantum, you only get sets. You know, here you're getting something slightly more interesting. Here are a few examples. Uh, again, I picked them from the paper. You can prove a couple of uh, some of them. They're not difficult to prove. Basically, you take the put C, uh, put three one is the three foil. This is the notation of knots in the knot table. Three one. There's only one knot with three with three uh, crossing. Only one knot with uh, four crossing. Uh, two knots with the five crossing. Five one and five two. And then you move on to knot six crossing. Then uh, the three foil. The three foil. The the braid form of it is just sigma one cubed. Just take two strings and put three cross in. And then you put a vector AB on the top. You push the coloring down. Uh, now here he is coloring the, this knot by the two sphere. Remember the two sphere, X triangle Y is you rotate X around Y. Or algebraically it was two X dot Y, Y minus X. And uh, with little, you write your equations, you get two equations. This is like what we did with the, the fundamental quantum of the three fold yesterday. The equations are almost it's are exactly the same, but you're solving this on the topological spaces. And in one case, basically, he proves that A and the B are equal. You, he gets one piece of the two sphere, the other piece gives the projective uh, space R3. Okay. And uh, if you look at, I didn't say anything about Kovano homology, but uh, Yosef will talk about it. And then uh, people computed the Kovano homology for this for this knot, and you will see some analogy between this. Okay, that basically uh, ends the the parts of topological quantums. Uh, now I will uh, move on to talk about uh, group algebras and uh, quantum algebras or quantum rings. Now, group algebras are very important in algebra. One of the reasons is they've been used to, uh, in, in the application of the theory of representation of groups. Uh, here are uh, some founders who worked on this theory. Brower, Richard Brower, Amy Noether, Isaiah Shur, and uh, Kaplansky. Kaplansky is famous by uh, his uh, work, uh, the, uh, 10 conjectures, I think, on half algebra, if I recall. Now, when I was a student, I learned a lot of quadratic forms uh, and the invariance of Kaplansky in, about that. Anyway, uh, here are really nice two books about uh, group algebras. And obviously, uh, from there, one can try to uh, figure out the analogous for quantums. A book by uh, Passman, this is the title is Algebraic Structure of Group Rings. Uh, I think I have a copy here. This is the library's copy. I brought it home. Okay. Uh, I don't know where I put it, but anyway, it's a nice book. And there is a book by Passy. Uh, it's Group Ring and Their Augmentation. It's Lecture Not in Mathematics, Volume 7, 15, 1979. And these uh, two books are interesting if you want to learn about uh, group algebras and obviously uh, try to see the analogous for quantum rings. As I mentioned, uh, here are uh, two conjectures of uh, Kaplansky. The first one is called Kaplansky zero divisor conjecture, which states if you have a torsion free group and uh, you have a field, you take the group, the, the, the algebra of the group f of g, you know, the formal combination sigma of uh, a sub g, g. This group uh, algebra or group ring has no zero divisor. That's the first conjecture. Now, if you look on the literature, people have worked uh, 
on this. Many work on it. You can check on the archive. There is a related conjecture. It's called the Kaplansky's idempotent conjecture, which says for a torsion-free group G and field, this has no non-trivial idempotent. Obviously, the trivial idempotent are uh, one and zero, because idempotent mean uh, a squared equal a, which mean a multiply a minus one equal zero, and uh, if there are no zero divisors, obviously you have no choice, either a equals zero or a minus one equals zero. Then clearly the first conjecture implies the second one. The zero divisor conjecture implies the I don't pretend to. conjecture. Uh, Bardakov, Passy, and Singh investigated an analog of Kaplansky conjecture over the Quandle ring. And I will talk about that uh, uh, in a little bit. Now, before I get into that, I have to review a little bit of uh, quandle rings. Then you start with your quandle X. K is a ring. Let's assume it's nice, you know, associative, it has unity, it has all the stuff. And then you consider the formal combination. Basically, you create a vector space with the basis element, the element of X. Then just for students, I write E sub X, I could have just written A sub X, X then the, the x become the basis, the element of x are the basis vectors, and the scalars comes from the ring k. Now, obviously, we're doing algebra, we assume uh, that ax is zero for almost all x, okay, finitely many, non-zero. Now, one checks, like you do with, with the group algebra, that this is a ring, addition is intuitive, you just add like, you know, when you have the same vector, you put the, the, the scalars together, and the multiplication is given by this. Now in the group algebra, usually you just multiply these two elements in the group. If I had a group, I will multiply X and Y in the group. Now you are in a quandle, you multiply these elements, X and Y into the, 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 the quandle. Now usually in quandle, there's no addition. I cannot do anything about the element. I cannot even add two elements in quandle. But here we are linearizing, which is nicer. We can do more algebra, okay? You get, you get a ring, you have an addition, multiplication, you have the distributivity, you have a good stuff. Then this is the definition of the quandle ring. Uh, now, usually quandles are in general non-associative. The only quandle that is associative is the trivial quandle. Then one can see this quickly, that uh, quandle operation is associative in, if, and only if it's the trivial operation that is x triangle y equal x for all x y and uh, this is basically one line proof if you do the associativity uh, here you you write the distribute you get x z x triangle z triangle y triangle z and then you can have y triangle z on the right and you have it here on the right remember that multiplication by every element on the right is invertible then you can cross y triangle z from each side and you'll be left with x equal x triangle z for any x z that means the quandle operation is trivial then uh, this means that uh, if X is non-trivial quandle, the quandle ring is non-associative ring. We still call them a ring even though they are non-associative. There are some people saying uh, we shouldn't call them rings. But anyway, it's just non-associative rings. Okay? Non-associative algebraic structures. Okay. Uh, left identity in quandle. Usually, uh, th this, this quandle ring is, doesn't behave like, like the, the group group rings group rings are slightly more nicer because in the group you have identity you know you have associativity of the group makes the uh, the, the group uh, ring is associative here it's non-associative but again it's it's interesting when things get slightly more complicated that means it's more interesting there's something to do there's something to think about uh, uh, if you assume that e is uh, an identity from the left then you get obviously uh, X has to have only one element, E itself. And this is just replacing X by X triangle X and get rid of X from the right. Thus, if X is non, not a singleton, then the quantum ring doesn't have unit. Unit or unity, I don't know. What's the right way of saying unit? I guess unity or unit. Okay. Uh, 
like the, with the group algebra, we can, uh, you can take the augmentation ID. And basically you have a sigma of AX, EX. You just map E sub X to one here. And uh, you can check that this is nice uh, homomorphism, ring homomorphism. It's surjective clearly by, by definition. And then you can take the kernel of it. The kernel happened to be a two-sided ideal and it's called the augmentation ideal. Okay, again, this is in parallel with the, the group algebras. Now, group algebras have been studied a lot. There are a lot of, at least I showed you two books on the subject. Uh, obviously, you can find more stuff on the archive. Okay, and clearly, uh, the quotient will be uh, isomorphic. This is a ring isomorphism. K of X modulo the augmentation ideal. Now, for the augmentation ideal, you can find the, the generators basically. You have this sum, you're gonna force this equal zero, and then you can get one uh, function of the others with little manipulation. You can see that the basis will be, if you fix an element in the quantum, say X naught, then any elements of the type EX minus EX will be mapped to zero because you're gonna have the, the coefficients one plus minus one, that's zero. Then if you have a finite quantum of cardinality N, this will be N minus one dimensional. You can write the, the basis explicitly. If your quantum uh, call it one to N, then you can have E1 minus, uh, E2 minus E1, E3 minus E1, et cetera, EN minus one, E1. Uh, this is a result in the first article, 2017 of uh, Bardakov, Passi and Singh. Uh, the article title is Quandle Rings. At the end, I will have a few references and uh, I will mention, uh, you will see this article. This is in fact what, what uh, when I saw this article on the archive, it uh, gave me the, I wanted to investigate uh, quandle rings. Uh, okay, then uh, this is a nice characterization of trivial quandles in terms of their augmentation ideal. And they prove that the quandle is trivial if and only if the square of the augmentation ideal is, is trivial, is zero. Now, one way is obvious, if, if X is trivial, uh, remember this is generated by, uh, if I go back, you're gonna multiply two elements of this type, EX minus EX naught, multiply EY minus uh, e, uh, EX naught. And then you distribute, you multiply, but your operation is kind of, uh, or and it's just a trivial operation, you automatically get the zero when you multiply. Now you have to go the other way, okay? And uh, the details, you can find them in the paper. But again, if you assume that this is zero, uh, any product of the tape EX minus EX naught, parenthesis multiply EY minus EX naught has to be zero. In particular, EX minus EX naught multiply itself has to be zero, you expand. You can have uh, something equal zero in, in the vector space, you know, you know uh, linearly independent, you will have not much choice. You will have, uh, you have two positive terms and two po negative net terms. Obviously they have to uh, cancel in pairs basically, and then you end up with uh, this result. Again, for the details, you can see the paper. The... Okay. Uh, now, when things are not associative, there is some notion slightly weaker of associativity. It's called the power associativity. And uh, the main work of this uh, is this famous paper by uh, A. A. Albert. I think it's the Chicago School, University of Chicago Algebra. And uh, in 1948, he wrote this nice paper on the transaction of the AMS. You can get access to it directly from the internet. And uh, uh, ring, uh, any ring. Obviously here when I'm saying ring, I mean non-associative rings. Obviously uh, if it's associative, these things become a little bit trivial, obviously trivial. If you have an associative ring and you pick one element, this, uh, the, the sub ring will be associative. Then an, I should say a non-associative ring R in which every element generates an associative sub ring is called power associative ring. Okay, then this is, now, uh, usually we take associativity for granted, okay? 
Now here, even if you have the same element, say X or U, if you multiply it by itself three times, you have two ways of putting the parentheses. You may not even get equality or you have to discuss because you know this is not associative operation. Uh, here is a nice example of, uh, of uh, uh, power associative rings. It's the algebra of octonians. You take the eight dimensional algebra of octonians, it's given by generators. You can even see that you can write the Cayley table for it. Uh, this goes under the umbrella of what is more general called alternative algebras. All alternative algebras are power associative. I've done some work on this some years ago with some algebraists. The definition of uh, alternative algebras. Now, when you're dealing with this, you're thinking Jordan algebras, you know, all those non-associative algebra extractors. Uh, the famous Jacobson uh, works on that, uh, Albert and uh, many others. Uh, an, an algebra is called the uh, alternative if it satisfies this ident two identity. Now you have two elements x and y, you multiply. See here you just put the parentheses either to the right or to the left, and you require equality. Or you have x, y, y, and then you put yeah. And as I said, this is a nice example of alternative. Obviously, every associative algebra will satisfy these things. Then that's better than then see if you Okay, now we get to really nice theorem of Albert, and this is what allows us to, to really work and uh, deal with these uh, quantum rings, is that this nice characterization. Now it says that uh, uh, a ring R, non-associative ring R of characteristic zero, is power associative if and only if you have this identity. Now look at this. You pick uh, the same element three times, and you put parentheses around either uh, to, the, to the left or to the right. Now you have four elements, the same element x, x four times, and you put parentheses, the, you know, the, this way. Now he proved that you can check his, his papers, that the, the, the ring will be power associative if and only if these two identities are satisfied for every element in your ring. Then obviously, if you want to ask, uh, does the, the quandal uh, or is the quandal ring uh, uh, power associative? You have to study these two equations in the quandal ring. Now, as I mentioned, when I saw uh, Bardakov, Passi, and Singh's paper on the archive, and I had already little, uh, have done some work on power associative and alternative algebra just gave me an idea to get uh, interested in this. Now here is the theorem. Now they proved uh, that if you have a, let K be a ring of characteristic two, three, uh, avoid two, three, five, because when you start doing the algebra, you see why you require this. And uh, take the dihedral quandal of three elements, then the quandal ring is not power associative. Now your X has three elements, call them zero, one, two. The quandal rings will be the space generated by E sub zero, E sub one, E sub two. And uh, the, the product of two, dis two different gives you the third one. That's the characteristic in the, this dihedral quandal. This dihedral quandal is symmetric. X triangle Y equal Y triangle X. And this basically the only one. When you move to others, the, the Kelly tail is not symmetric. Now again, uh, you can see the proof in, in the paper. I will not go through the proof. Uh, if you are students, I advise you to try these things before before you see the proofs in the paper. Then take the idea, go back here, and uh, now a random element will be uh, a sub zero e zero plus a one uh, plus a sub one e e sub one plus a sub two e two. That's a general element, and then you have to compute. Put the computation here and uh, try. Okay. Uh, Another case, this is also another theorem in the first paper of uh, Bardak of Passi Singh, which this is 2017. It says that if you have a ring with characteristic not two, now get rid of the three and the five, take the dihedral quantum Zn, n is greater than, than three, obviously three will be done with it, then the quantum ring is still not power associated. And this gave me a little feeling that maybe they are, in general, they are not power uh, associated. And obviously, outside the trivial quandle, uh, 
the, the quandal rings will be not power associated. And that's exactly what I just said here. Uh, quandal rings are in general uh, not power associated when the characteristic of the ring K is zero. Now I proved this with uh, uh, Fernando Neranga and Boris Svensvihovi back in 2018. The theorem says that if, you, if K is the ring of characteristic zero and X triangle is non-trivial quantum, then this quantum ring is, is never power associated. Now I will go a little bit through the idea of the proof. Uh, obviously I will skip some, some, uh, some details. Uh, uh, for students, they can look into the paper. We basically reduce the study into two main cases, okay? The first case is, uh, assume that the quandal has this property, that there are two elements, two distinct elements in quandal, such that X triangle Y equal Y triangle. Now, obviously, the ideas came after uh, we read the papers, the, the, uh, this paper of Pardak, of Pasi and Singh. Now, in, the, in Z3, this property was satisfied for all of them. Uh, the, the quandal uh, R3 with three elements, X triangle Y equal Y triangle X for any X1. Now, if you assume this, basically you pick, uh, pick an element uh, of the shape AX plus BY, you compute A multiply, uh, U multiply U, since X triangle Y equal Y triangle X, you get, you get this equality. You can group the X triangle Y and Y triangle X and you gather this this way. Now, when you have this, if you compute this, you get equality. This, auto, this equality, the first one is automatically satisfied. Now, remember, if I go back again to Albert theorem, is this, you have to check two things. This first identity, and then you have to check the second one. Now, in this case, in this first case, we get this is satisfied automatically. Then we have to move on to the second uh, equality. U dot U parenthesis dot this, this one. And then we do the computation. Obviously, I'm skipping some steps here and I just jump to uh, this conclusion that X triangle Y equal X triangle Y triangle Y. Basically, remember, I have this for any AB. I get basically, I think of it as polynomial in AB and I identify the the coefficients of, of the, the terms in, in uh, powers of A or AB, you know. Basically, I specialize by picking some specific values for A's of B's to get these things. Now, again, there are some uh, steps in between. There is no time to go through them. I just uh, skip and give you basically the idea. Now, when you get this, you get contradiction, okay? Uh, the contradiction is not difficult. Remember, this element is I don't put in. Then you can replace this by, uh, Oh, here, I'm sorry. You can just basically get rid of Y from the right. Right multiplication by Y is invertible. Get rid of Y and you get X equal X triangle Y. But remember, now with this, I cannot conclude, but remember X triangle Y equal Y triangle X. And then here, I can replace X by X triangle X. Get rid of X from the right and you end up with X equal Y, which is contradiction. Because we started with X not being equal Y. Uh, about 10 minutes. Okay, uh, here is another case. Obviously, things get slightly more involved if, if you look at the details, but I'm just trying to resume uh, the proof and give basically the idea. This is the second case. The other complementary is that assume that for any x, y, such that x is not y, I have x triangle y is not y triangle x. Now here, uh, this case is slightly different than this previous case. In this previous case, uh, this, this was automatic. Assuming this equality, X triangle Y equal Y triangle X, you get this equality. In the next, in the next case, this will not be the case. Then you will have to really uh, work for this one and work for this one. Now, as you can tell, when you, when you compute uh, U multiply U, you get this. Now, the previous case, because these two were equal, we were able to group this together. Now you compute, uh, you, you require equality uh, like this, and then you get this equality. This is in the vector space in the, in the quantum ring. 
and uh, things things are linearly independent then you have no choice uh, two elements on the right two elements on the left then this one has to be equal one of the two others and by looking at cases you can can basically will be done then uh, this implies that x triangle x triangle y equal x triangle y uh, you already see because i'm sorry here i just see it sorry uh, x triangle y cannot be y triangle x then this cannot be this which means x triangle y has to be the right term here this one here because it cannot be equal to the other one and this is exactly the, the equation you have here x triangle x triangle y equal this now uh, again this is i don't put it write this twice x triangle y triangle itself so you can cancel this from the right and then you get your contradiction Okay, and um, outside the trivial quandle, quandle rings are never power associated. Uh, again, uh, this qu question was raised, uh, are the quandle rings some kind of invariance of the quandles? Now, obviously, if, if two quandles are isomorphic, then their quandle ring will be isomorphic as, as rings. But does the converse hold? Uh, we give uh, two examples this is just a few examples chosen from uh, from the paper for which the quandle rings will be isomorphic but the quandles will not be in fact uh, i had the list of quandles from that work of uh, jennifer and uh, ricardo the classification of quandles i mentioned yesterday and that's basically where we were doing the search uh, here is the first example now i just put the quandle in the kelly table uh, the weird things here we write them as e sub one you can think just one two three four one two three four your quandle has four elements quandle and this is its kelly table is the diagonal in the middle because it's idempotent and it's given by this again these are chosen from the from that uh, classification one way of describing quandles maybe i didn't mention yesterday is i can just tell you what are right multiplication now, what is R, R1 here? R1 is just the identity. It sends 1 to 1, 2 to 2, 3 to 3, 4 to 4. Then R1 is 1. Okay, I'm ignoring the E. R2 is just identity. It's just look at the columns and they make the, the, the that define your quandle completely. If you give me the R sub I, I know the quandle completely because I have the Kelly table. Now, here it's not the identity, obviously. It's the transposition 1, 2. Uh, three is fixed four is fixed this is transposition one two for uh, for uh, for r3 and r4 i have to make sure uh, uh, i move on and uh, r4 will be just what uh, one two uh, same thing r3 equal r1 then r1 equal r1 equal r2 equal identity r3 equal r4 equal the transposition one two now for the second one again I already know in advance that these are non-isomorphic quandles because we I'm picking them up from that list. And the thing I have to do is I have to devise uh, an isomorphism between the quandle rings. Basically, I have to come up with a mapping of this the vector basis here to this vector basis, so that is an isomorphism. Now here on this quandle, just to make it look distinct, we put the primes. Then R1 is one, two, three, four. That's identity, identity. The difference is here. Uh, this R3 will be the transposition 1, 2, but R4 is 1, 2. Uh, okay. Uh, is there something I'm not. Oh, okay. Uh, these are these things. Yes. Okay. Uh, no, R4, it sends 1 to 1. I'm sorry. 1 to 1, 2 to 2. This is identity still then. R1 equal R2 equal R4 identity, and R3 is a transposition one. Two. Okay, sorry, I got confused for a second. And here is the isomorphism explicitly. I just map E1 to E prime one, two to two, and then I map the last one into the sum E1 plus E2 plus E3 plus E4, and you check explicitly that this is a ring isomorphism. Okay. Uh, we were able to generalize this obviously by adding uh, again uh, something I didn't say is that when you have a quandle it decomposes by the action of the inner group then you have the orbits 
And uh, that's important. You have to look at the orbits. And in fact, we define some kind of uh, type of quandle by counting the orbits and their cardinality. Now here, X and Y are the previous quandle I had. And then the game, basically, we just add trivial component. One element quandle is trivial, et cetera, of this shape. And then we can explicitly construct uh, uh, two quandles. Now, these are obviously uh, non-connected quandles because we have many orbits. If K, uh, Y and uh, Y tilde and Y tilde and Y, X tilde and Y tilde are not isomorphic because X and Y are not isomorphic. If this were isomorphic quandles, obviously this orbit has to be mapped to this orbit because the others are singleton. And uh, I assume that's characteristic P, but we have to assume obviously also that P does not, uh, that P divide N minus one, okay? then the isomorphism is given similarly. I just send the outside four, I send it to just the same thing. And uh, P of E4 is the previous formula I had. Uh, except here it goes from one to N, and this is the ring isomorphism. Uh, I have about four minutes, I have to make sure I move on. Uh, here is another example, slightly bigger. Remember when, uh, you look at those first theorem of Bardakov, there were cases of characteristic. You have to avoid characteristic uh, two, three, and five. Two, three, five appear uh, uh, often when you're doing this algebraic uh, study. Then here, here are two quanders of order six. They are not isomorphic. Again, as I explained earlier, we choose them, and then we construct an isomorphism between the quandal rings. It's basically by mapping the basis vectors into the basis vector, and then that gives you the isomorphism. Uh, oh, I have three more minutes. I guess I'm getting close to finish. Uh, few properties of, of, of quandle rings, you know. Uh, if you have a finite quandle, let's say, it doesn't have to be finite, but just say a quandle with more than, than two elements, then the quandle ring cannot be integral domain. You have zero divisors. The trick is just this. Take this element here, add all the elements in the quandle. Again, I'm assuming my quandle is finite. If I multiply by x minus y, it's always zero. Now, that shouldn't be hard to tell. For students, I leave it for you to think of it for a little while. The trick is that I'm adding all elements in my quandle here. Then basically you have to prove that this element right multiplication by x and right multiplication by y are the same. I have two minutes. Okay, uh, we, did in, uh, we discussed also uh, some properties about Noetherian, but I don't have time to talk about that. Uh, the question, are there, uh, they, they raised, Bardakov, uh, Pasi and Singh raised this question. Uh, I think we, uh, we raised this question. Are there quanders for which the quantum ring is a domain? And they come up with the, the, the solution in the second paper. They talk about unique products quantum by analogy with, uh, with uh, this is the definition. This is paper is in 2020. The quantum is up, up for, uh, unique product quantum. This, the theory exists for groups. It's in, uh, you can see the book of uh, Passman. And uh, a quantum is uh, up quantum if for any non-empty uh, uh, finite subset A and B, you can find an element in X such that has a unique representation. You can write X as A triangle Y, uh, A triangle B, where, where A is chosen from A and the B is chosen from B. And the theorem is, they prove that, uh, assume that K is domain, you mean you have no zero divisor in K, then X is an up quandle. If uh, X is an up quandle, then the quandle ring has no zero divisors. Uh, if you give me a few minutes, I should be able to finish. Uh, yeah. the, proof, uh, the proof is here. Again, you, uh, the, you can read the, the paper and see the details. You pick two elements, you multiply them. Here, I just focus on the first two terms. They multiply in this and the leftover. And the trick is pick A to be the, the, the X i's, B the Y i's. And then uh, since X is an up quandle, this piece, the, the X triangle Y, Z, B, and this is unique. And then you can prove that there will be nothing which can cancel this 
with the sum and then the product is non-zero then you have non-zero divisor this is a nice theorem and uh, when we discussed that uh, with my quarters we we didn't think at all about this i didn't even know the notion of up quandles okay uh, in order to state the analog of kaplan's key conjecture then uh, uh, we have to uh, introduce this definition a quandle obviously with cardinality more than one is called inert if there exists finite sub subsets a a1 an and two distinct elements x and y such that ax now when i say ax i mean you pick all elements of n you multiply them by the right uh, from the right by x and uh, the conjecture the analogous is let k be an integral domain x be non-inert semi-latin semi quandle now i gave you the definition yesterday of semi-latin quandle left multiplication being injective latin mean left multiplication being inversible full bijection here you only require it to be uh, injective not necessarily surjective then the quandle has uh, no zero divisors oh it's perfect then thank you very much for your attention now obviously for students you will have to uh, go to the papers and read more details okay thank you i'm done thank you so we have one question um sure. do alexander topological quandles provide any insight to rubinstein invariants i'm sorry can can you i'm sorry can you repeat the question one more time do alexander topological quandles provide any insight to rubinstein invariants good question uh, uh, i didn't think of it but i think that's a nice question honestly i, I we didn't think about it okay. we were completely focusing on class on classification of quandles i think even the title of that paper is classification of quandles but this is interesting this is gives me a nice idea of some of my some homework to do yes uh, yeah, Amrit has a question uh, if you are taking a quandle then we know that there is a natural quandle homomorphism from quandle q to the conjug conjugation quandle of its associated group as q say this map eta so if q is the topological quandle can we give some natural topology to its associated group such that uh, that associated group becomes topological group and the map becomes uh, uh, quandle homomorphism you can do a little bit of that but you really have to work a little bit hard uh, i have a little bit some ingredient from this in one paper i think the title is called the foundation of topological quandle with my previous uh, postdoc like even if you try to define inner inner group for the topological quandle you have to work a little bit hard we have basically we have to take the closure you take the, uh, the the group generated by right multiplication but you have to take the closure basically if you want to do any of this you have to go to the group case like we like uh, uh, what we did here with the quandary ring start from the the group case look at the result and the theorem and try to transfer them to the quandary case then yes that's doable but it requires a little bit a uh, little bit of extra work then i advise students to look at that paper i didn't mention it at all it's just called the, it's on the archive foundation of topological quandary in which we define the inner group of topological quandary and the requirement is that you take the closure here you have to be careful even this the topology on the color in space it uses the cop, uh, compact open topology there are more technicalities one has to work but the good thing is that the structure gets richer and then you can use maybe tools from uh, topological group theory and things like that so okay so one more question can we obtain topological invariant quandles by using the structure of uh, quandle rings oh excellent that's question i asked myself and my quarters i have no idea but that's something honestly which will be great i i asked this question myself and uh, with boris uh, and uh, niranga and uh, we, we discussed it will be really nice that's maybe something for uh, also topologists and algebraic uh, all uh, all together Yes, come up with uh, construct some invariants of 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 knots uh, using the quandle rings. That will be really nice. I don't know yet. I didn't have any idea, but that's something interesting to think about. So one more question regarding Maple program. So can you give some papers or some referees uh, where the students can get uh, this uh, regarding the Maple program, which gives the bottom vector of a braid colored by a quandle. Uh, I'm sorry. So do you have uh, some references for Maple program 
which can provide a, a braid colored by a quandal oh yes uh we have some programs maybe dr saito has a website i am the old style i'm not much good at technology the only thing is i know maple i learned it when i landed at usf and i'm usually not good at it but with my students we managed to get things usually they do better than myself I think Dr. Saito has some maple programs on his website. Just go to www.usf or just put uh, Dr. Saito, Masahiko Saito on the website, on, on Google. I think he, he keeps uh, his website uh, updated or at least he posted some, some programs there, yes. I have some maple programs. If students email me, I don't mind sharing them. I, I honestly, yes. But they weren't written by me. It's a combination of many students through the years. I don't mind sharing those things. I'm not good at putting these things on the website. Even the website usually is made for me. I'm sorry, I'm not that technology okay. good at technology. It's the uh, old French school. Yeah. Yes. One more question. Are there any topological quandals on real line other than topological Alexander quandals up to isomorphism? A good question. Uh, okay. I would say there are, yes. Uh, in fact, as I mentioned, uh, this, these things are really interesting to, to study because this brings a little bit of analysis, you know, uh, you can do limit sequences and stuff. Uh, we, we were uh, discussing that, we, we claimed that on the closed interval zero one, the only uh, topological quantum structure will be the trivial quantum, but we missed it. I think, uh, Boris, Boris, my quarter, Boris, he put some paper on the archive in which he disproved this conjecture. I think it will be good for students to look at that. And yes, there are other, other, uh, keep in mind that we are focusing on those topological uh, Alexander quantum because that makes uh, computation very nice. I have that algebraic formula alpha X plus beta Y. And then that's basically, it brings my souvenir when I was undergrad student, we used to do functional equations in, in France. And, you know, we used to make up some functions. It's like Cauchy equations, you know, all for people who do analysis at the R, yes. Then, again, Alexander Quandel are very nice. Algebraically are nice to, to manipulate. But outside, that's obvious. Yes, there are, the answer is yes, there are other, other topological Quandel, yes. Okay. But keep in mm -hmm. mind, when I gave that definition, the topological Quandel, I had to say that definition of topological Alexander Quandel. I start from a group. A group of auto automorphism, and then we, we look at, at uh, the, the quantum out of it. Okay. So is, this study is also extended to virtual nodes also, right? I, I'm, I'm sorry? Uh, for virtual nodes also, these uh, biquandals uh, uh, means... Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, yes. Here I only talked about quandal, but you can do biquandals. Absolutely, yes, yes. No, biquandals are... are uh, used a lot in uh, virtual knot theory okay. uh, in a couple of papers with uh, my co-authors uh, Carter and Seto we, we use them to distinguish for example the Kishino knot okay. we can do uh, something from the WADA, WADA okay anyway yes correct yes yes whatever mm -hmm. I said can be translated to uh, to uh, by quantas for students that can be good good uh, things to okay. investigate yes any more questions from the participants? So, Professor Ramdadi, I have a question. Yes. So, when you talked about the Rubinstein invariant, uh, I observe that this uh, topological coloring invariant always has uh, the sphere as one of the components. Correct. Yeah, so is it oh. that? Yeah, yeah, the answer is, yeah, yeah. Because that's if you use a trivial coloring. When you get those, uh, if you look at the example, for example, the trifold, you get an equation, uh, A triangle, uh, A, B equal whatever. And then there is always solution A equal B. The solution A equal B give you that piece. Again, uh, in one of the paper with uh, uh, Edwin Clark and Masahiko, we talk about uh, uh, quantum coloring and we really explicitly write uh, uh, quantum coloring, the cardinality is the cardinality of the quantum plus the other piece. Then you, since you always have the trivial coloring, then you can, if you don't want to care about that, you just move to the other piece, correct, yes. So it will always have this topological quandal as one of the components. Right, that's what you mean? Yes, correct, yes. 
because basically when you do, if you write the fundamental quandle, uh, let me think a little bit, uh, make sure I'm not saying something wrong. Uh, yes, yes, because, because if you take, if you have a generators, doesn't matter how many generators in your fundamental quandle, uh, the setting the, uh, oh, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, okay, I, maybe I will back it. One has to look at more examples. Maybe that's misleading because I, I only gave a few examples. Yeah, no problem. I, I don't want, yes, I don't want to state something not correct. Yes, uh, um, yes. What is the question again? I, oh, the I question. didn't under, understand the question. <laughs> yes, maybe, uh, good morning, Seichi. Uh, good morning. Uh, yes, it's good night. Is, uh, when I put when I uh, put those uh, quantum coloring uh, of topological quantum of uh, Rubinstein, they they were coloring by the two sphere, and the output oh, yeah. always had a piece which is S two, the sphere itself. Then the question was, do you always get if you take coloring of K by some topological quantum X? Do you mm -hmm. always get X as one piece, uh, this one tuning some other stuff? That's the question. I wanted to say yes, but then I start backing the answer. Maybe you can, uh, you can. Uh, yes, that, yes, that is a trivial uh, coloring. That's the trivial coloring. That's what yes. I get. Yes. Mm -hmm. You take the fundamental quantum and then the trivial coloring will all, always give you that piece. Then uh, if yes. you want non-trivial coloring, you can discard that. Maybe we should change the, that coloring into the other coloring in which we ignore the, the trivial one and then we can get rid of that. Uh, yes, okay, thanks, Seichi. Yes, absolutely. Then the answer, uh, uh, Mender, the answer is yes, correct. Thank you. So you uh, topological quantum are interesting. I think uh, we, we should do more investigation on it. There is another paper by, by uh, uh, Rubinstein and uh, Rasmussen, it's on the archive, but unfortunately it has never been published. I was given some hint from uh, Charlie Froman, but that paper is really nice. It's a long, long paper, it's on the archive. There is a lot of it, I, it's very hard for me, I don't understand it. But when I focus on only chapter nine, topological quantum, I, I get some ideas and stuff. They do some characteristic classes, it's, it's really, uh, it's good paper. It's it's worth worth looking at, and maybe some group of students or professor with students can make some seminar on that. It's really nice. Yes, it just puts. Uh, if you go to put archive Rubinstein, make sure you put his last name correctly, and then you will you'll see the papers on the archive. The one I talked and the one I I didn't mention or the one which has never been published. Now thanks to Google nowadays we can get everything. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Professor Alhamdulillah.